Chapter 46 It didn't take long for Link's plan to come to fruition. He wore his champion's tunic, which was too heavy during the heat of the day, but felt quite nice as the sun set and the sky turned a twilight orange. He had remained at the bazaar all day, shopping and mostly being invisible, while wearing the Master Sword prominently on his back. Now, however, he chose to start walking in the direction of the city. Before too long, he caught sight of two people following behind him, and it appeared as though a person in front of him had stopped walking towards the city as well. Three? Word must have gotten out, he thought with a wry smile. Of course, there could be even more out there, but he hoped that wouldn't be the case. If the numbers grew to be too much, however, then he had his backup route secured. One of the guards, having been told that he was a Sheikah researcher, had led him to the nearest Sheikah shrine, which had not been far from the city at all, though it had been hidden from view by a pair of boulders. Being bait hadn't been his initial plan. Actually, his original plan was to teleport back to Kakarika Village and inquire with Impa about the Yiga that had attacked her in Paya and see if any of their garments remained. He did just that, surprising both of the Sheikah women when he arrived so soon. Unfortunately, their bodies, clothes, and masks had all been burned. Impa wanted to muster a force of Sheikah to infiltrate the base, but he had refused. A bunch of the new Sheikah in the Gerudo Desert wouldn't go unnoticed, and the Sheikah were needed in Nakluda. The force of monsters at Hatano had begun to conduct raids against the village. They had been fought off so far, thanks to the timely arrival of some Gorons, but the situation there was growing dangerous. Which meant Link was to be the bait. He stopped walking, reaching up and drawing the Master Sword. He didn't relish the idea of killing these people, but he would do what he needed to do. They found out to surround him on three sides, and at once they donned their white masks. Good, Link thought, readying himself. He reached up and pulled down the pair of goggles over his eyes. They attacked, rushing him from all sides. He waited until they got closer, and then reached down pressing the screen of the Sheikah Slate. A bomb appeared in front of him, and he kicked it towards the nearest Yiga, who looked at it in confusion before it exploded a moment later. The bomb kicked up a huge cloud of sand and dust, and he rushed forward, ignoring the two Yiga behind him for a moment. He passed into the cloud of dust and found the third Yiga lying on the sand some five feet away, stunned. Link thrust his sword down into the Yiga's chest. He whirled, seeing the dark shapes of the other two Yiga in the dust cloud. He froze one of them, with stasis, and then leaped forward, slamming his sword against the other's sickle blade with a strong two-handed chop that actually snapped the blade in half and continued on, cutting a deep gash in the Yiga's torso. Two of the Yiga killed. Link spun just as the final one came out of stasis, stumbling. Link attacked before he could regain his bearing, bringing his sword down on the Yiga's wrist, slicing off the hand that held his weapon. The Yiga cried out in pain, but that cry became a choked gasp as Link threw his right arm around the Yiga's neck from behind and squeezed. The assassin struggled for a time, trying to pry Link's arm off his neck, but Link's hold was secure. Within a minute, the Yiga had stopped struggling. He let the final body drop to the floor, breathing deeply. Around him, three bloody corpses lay, staining the sands red. He felt sick, but knew that it had been necessary. There was no time for finesse. Scout reports had said Naboris had turned in the direction of Gerudo Town. If it didn't turn, then he didn't have much time at all. He bent down to remove the mask from the Yiga that he had choked to death, and an arrow shot through the air and took him in the shoulder. Crying out, he leaped away, rolling as another two arrows stuck into the sand where he'd been kneeling. The arrow shaft in his shoulder snapped, sending a flare of agony through his right arm. He looked up and saw two Yiga atop a nearby dune, each pointing wicked-looking recurve bows at him. 
swearing. Link ran as another series of arrows flew at him. As he did so, he reached back and yanked the shield free of its place on his back. He didn't have time to secure it on his arm properly, so he just grabbed its handle and held it in front of him. An arrow deflected off of it. He turned towards the archers, who appeared startled by his approach. One of them fumbled with an arrow, dropping it. Before he could reach them, however, a pair of arrows from another direction zipped through the air and struck one of the Yiga archers in the chest. The two archers fell, and he stopped running, sighing. He turned as two Gerudo women approached from their hiding places, each holding a beautiful golden bow. They were on loan to him by Captain Teak from the city. She had bristled at the thought of having her soldiers taking orders from a Hylian vow, but Boliara had carried an order directly from Riju. None of them, of course, knew that Link had been in the city just the day before. Sao Ten, Liana said, lowering her veil and looking around at the bodies in the sand. She looked impressed. Kota, the other Gerudo, nudged the body of the one Link had tugged with her toe. They really wanted you dead, she said. How did you know they would attack? This was the... he hesitated, thinking. Fifth time they tried to kill me? Well, fourth. One of those times they were actually trying to kill someone close to me. They're becoming predictable. Impressive. Liana raised her eyebrows, fixing Link with a stare. Before she could say anything else, however, Koda cut her off. Do you have a vi? Back wherever you are from, I mean. Kota, now is not the time to be trying to find a husband. It was just a question, Kota protested. Link flushed. I, uh, kind of. Oh well, Kota said, shrugging. I'm going to need to leave the desert soon to find a vo. I didn't know that Hylians had such strong warriors. Link chose to let that line of conversation drop, turning to look at the bodies again. As he did so, however, his shoulder flared with pain again, and he gritted his teeth, glancing over and seeing the broken shaft still sticking out of his shoulder. The arrow had passed right through his shoulder, and the fletching had been broken off. He glanced back towards the woman, grimacing. Can one of you pull that out? Liana stepped forward, reaching forward and bracing a hand against Link's back. She reached up and yanked the arrow free. He hissed in pain, closing his eyes tightly until it faded. A moment later, the Gerudo raised his arm while Koda approached with a cloth, which she used to wrap the shoulder, looping it under his arm. When it was finished, he nodded. Thanks. Um, sock so. His arm taken care of for the time being, he finally stepped up to the Yiga that he had choked, reaching down and pulling the mask off. The face underneath was that of a sandy-haired man. Hesitating, Link turned the mask over and placed it against his face. Though the mask had no discernible eye holes, he was still able to see through it just fine, though colors appeared to be somewhat muted. It would do. It is through that canyon, Liana said. She had volunteered to bring Link to the canyon where the Yiga clan had holed up. Scout reports suggest that the canyon is a couple of miles deep. You'll know you're getting close when you start seeing the decorations. The canyon was nondescript, just a narrow gap between two tall, snow-capped plateaus. The moon was already growing low in the sky. There was close to thirty miles of nothing but sand between Gerudo Town and this canyon to the north. He was grateful for Liana's assistance. They had passed through a heavy sandstorm on the way here, and it had, oddly, interfered with his Sheikah Slate's navigation capabilities, rendering it next to useless. She, however, like most Gerudo, had a keen sense of direction. Will my sand still be alright out here? Link asked, glancing down at the creature, which had already fallen asleep. How could they seem so lazy, yet be capable of such good endurance? Then again, how was it that their fat bellies could so easily swim through sand? He was willing to bet that Zelda could have told him the answer. She will be fine, Liana said. She'll likely sleep the entire time you're gone. Link nodded, 
taking an uneasy breath. This wasn't anything like what he was used to. It wasn't even like infiltrating Hyrule Castle. The castle, for all its dangers, was not actually that dangerous once inside. At least it hadn't been on his trip. This, however, he was walking into what very well may be an elaborate trap. Link, Lyanna said, her voice growing tense. I am not sure if they told you this, but we have lost many Gerudo to these. She said something unfamiliar in Gerudo. Afterwards, she paused, taking a deep breath to steady herself. Many of my close friends were killed when we attacked them, and some of our scouts are still unaccounted for. He grimaced. I'm not sure how many of them I will be killing, Liana. In fact, I'm hoping to go completely unnoticed. Liana nodded stiffly. I know this. I am no fool. But if you come across any of my sisters still alive in there, I'll get them out. She looked at him again and then held her hand out. Link moved to shake her hand, but she grabbed his forearm instead, holding it firmly. He'd seen this greeting amongst the Gerudo and mimicked it, grasping her forearm as well. May your ancestors watch over you this night, she said. They released each other and she boarded her sled. A few moments later, she and her sand seal were speeding away. She'd offered to stay and wait for him, but there was little point in doing so. Either he would be victorious, or he wouldn't. There was nothing more that she could do for him. He turned back towards the canyon and drew his cloak tightly around him. He wore some nondescript clothing, much like the other Yiga that he'd seen, and had on one of their dark red bodysuits underneath, taken off the body of one of the Yiga that he'd killed that day. He reached into his small satchel and removed the mask, looking at it with some disgust, before donning it. At once the night seemed to brighten, though the dulled colors as viewed through the mask made the landscape appear almost colorless. It was also considerably brighter than it had been. He wasn't sure what kind of magic went into making the mask, but it was impressive nonetheless. He touched the pair of sickles that hung from his belt. He'd been forced to leave the Master Sword behind in Biliara's care. While she still did not appear to approve of this venture, she swore to him that she would watch over the blade. The rest of his gear had either been left at the inn or with Ronson. He hadn't told her what he was doing. It appeared that knowledge of the Thunderhelm's theft was not widely known outside of the palace guard. He felt naked without his blade, but there was nothing he could do for it. The Master Sword was not something he could hide very easily during his infiltration, especially since none of the Yega he'd encountered so far wielded swords in that style. But finally, he began forward into the canyon. As soon as he passed between the walls, the moon disappeared from view, plunging him into darkness. His mask allowed him to see, however, without any problem. As he made his way through, he kept an eye out for any Yega, but it appeared that, for the moment, he was still alone. He spotted several ledges high on the canyon walls, however, that could hide watchers. He knew that there had to be some. No one had challenged him yet, so he hoped that meant his disguise would work. This canyon would be a killing field for any attacking foe, Link thought, as he eyed a particularly wide ledge some forty feet up on the canyon. A dozen or so archers could post up there and rain arrows down, and the Gerudo would be nearly helpless against it. The canyon had such narrow confines, they wouldn't even have to really aim, just point in the general direction and fire at will. It was ironic, he thought, that he had inadvertently stumbled upon the location of the Yega hideout, they had been a thorn in his side for so much of his journey, and he'd gone to great lengths to avoid entangling with them. Yet here he was, sneaking into the very heart of their base. It was pure foolishness, but he did not fear it, as he once might have. Everything he had done so far had been near suicide. He still lived despite his poor odds of success. He truly hoped that this would be no different. Link continued deep into the canyon, until it finally curved. After rounding the bend, he began to see some signs of the Yiga presence. Some of the walls had been painted with odd symbols. The upside-down Shika Eye was featured prominently on much of it. 
The canyon grew narrower as it gradually began to slope up. As the canyon walls closed in, he began to see small red and white banners that flapped in the wind. Further in, statues not that unlike the frog statues in Kakarika Village littered the ground and some of the ledges, though their faces had been all covered in a white cloth bearing the Yiga eye. The canyon ended abruptly, the slope growing too steep to progress. There was a simple cave entrance, however. It could have been a simple cave, but Link knew from the descriptions he'd been given that this was it. The Yiga hideout. Taking a deep breath, he moved towards it. There was a flash of light and smoke behind him, and he whirled, finding a member of the Yiga clan in his red bodysuit standing just behind him. Welcome home. I hope that calamity smiled upon your endeavors this night. Yes, Link said, in a slightly stilted tone. It's good to be home. The Yiga tilted his head, appearing to be waiting for something. Oh, damn, he's waiting for a passphrase, Link thought. He ripped one of the sickles off his belt, plunging it into the Yiga's chest. His cry of alarm became a death rattle before his body grew still. Cursing himself, Link looked around, eyes darting as he searched the ledges above. No alarm sounded, however, and no one else appeared to challenge him. Satisfied that he was alone, he wiped his sigil off on the body and clipped it back onto his belt before going around and taking the Yiga under his arms and dragging his body over to a large rock near the entrance. He stashed the body on the other side, out of sight from the entrance and hopefully from anyone watching. Taking one more glance around to ensure no one was watching, he walked into the dark entrance of the Yiga hideout. He walked through a short cave that opened into a large circular room with a surprisingly tall ceiling. The walls here were not made of roughly hewn rock, but of carved stone, and several identical banners hung above seven identical doorways along the walls. There was a raised pedestal in the center, lined by flickering torches. Link hesitated, looking around at the variety of choices. The doorway he passed through was, like the other seven, identical in every way even down to the way the passage beyond it looked. They all appeared to have the same cave-like passages. Grimacing, he stepped up to the central pedestal, looking around for any indication of which door to take. There were no signs, however, that indicated which one was the right one. It was as if the designer of the room had intended on confusing those who entered it. That was it, of course. The room was another security measure, just as the guard outside with the passphrase had been. He would bet that there were two variable doorways in this room, the one that led deeper into the hideout and the one that exited it. The others would almost certainly hold traps. Clever, he thought, but then sighed. He had no idea which of the doorways was the correct one. Should I just pick one at random? That seemed reckless. He had no idea what kind of traps the Yiga would have set, but he really didn't want to find out. But then what? Was there some kind of trick to figuring it out, or were the Yiga just expected to know? He eyed the eight torches that lined the central pedestal. Each of them was exactly like the others, with no distinguishing features. Other torches lined the walls as well, and he tried to determine if there was any way of determining the correct path from the pedestal. Everything looked the same, however. Sign, he stepped down from the pedestal and began to walk in a slow circle around the room. However, even as he stepped up to peer into one of the dark halls, he couldn't come up with any way to determine the correct way. In fact, he likely would have even lost sight of the exit, had it not been for his own footprints and the light coating of sand on the floor that led up to the pedestal. He paused, frowning. Wait. Sand? He began to circle again paying close attention to the ground now. The sand grew fainter the further he passed from the exit, where he expected that sand occasionally blew in. But it was still there. He could even see his own footprints, showing the path he first walked around the room. He finally found the barest hint of a set of footprints near one of the doors. It was clear that they had tried to keep the room clear of sand to prevent this very method, but he thought it likely that the recent sandstorm had blown some of this in and they hadn't yet cleaned it. 
However, someone had indeed left through this room. Feeling triumphant, Link edged up to the door, peering into the hall beyond. It was just like the others he'd seen with no apparent ways of telling the difference between them. It seemed to him that this was the best option he had, however, short of waiting for someone else to enter or exit. He hesitantly stepped into the hall and waited. Nothing happened. He cautiously crept forward, half expecting the floor to give way beneath him or an arrow to shoot out of a wall. But the hall appeared to be nothing more than a hall. Creeping forward, he soon reached a place where the hall curved. Once out of sight of the doorway, the walls shifted from rough rock to dark-colored bricks. The hall was nearly pitch black, too dark even for the Yiga mass to clearly show, leaving him with shadowy impressions of the walls and the floors. This didn't last long, however, as another bend in the hall brought a dimly lit room into view. Link hesitated before entering the room beyond, taking a deep, steadying breath and then he stood up straighter and walked forward into the light. He emerged onto an upper landing that overlooked an open room. A room with at least five other members of the Yiga clan. Three of them were sitting at a table together, a deck of playing cards laid out before them. One of them glanced up at Link when he neared the edge of the landing, nodded, and then looked back to his cards. The others at the table appeared too engrossed in their game to notice him. Another of the Yiga sat under a softly glowing lantern, polishing a long, curved blade like the one Link saw with one wielding in Kakarika Village. The final Yiga, oddly, was eating a banana. She lifted her mask just enough to take a bite of the banana before lowering it again while she chewed. The other four Yiga also wore their masks, which helped Link relax somewhat. The room itself was not large, but it appeared to be a common room of sorts. There were several tables set up, like the one the card players were sitting at, as well as other chairs of varying styles. He also saw more of the frog statues, their faces covered with his version of the Yiga mask. There were also a series of weapon racks to the one side of the room, bearing various weapons. The same types of weapons that Link usually saw them wielding, along with a few others that he hadn't seen, such as spears and a wicked-looking war axe. The walls were covered in white and red banners bearing the Yiga eye, and those colors were used extensively in other decorations as well. Tablecloths, chair upholstery and even a few rugs. The walls and floors not covered were all made of the same cut black stone. Link glanced briefly around, but the landing that he stood on appeared to serve little purpose other than to overlook this common room. After another moment's hesitation, he rounded a wooden railing and walked down the stairs into the room below. He selected a door at random, not wanting to appear unfamiliar or lost, and made his way down the hall beyond. He passed other doors and other rooms, none of which were terribly surprising. He passed what appeared to be a long barracks room, filled with at least two dozen beds, most of which appeared to have members of the Yiga clan still sleeping in them. There was a room apparently devoted to sparring, based on the sand pit in its center, and racks of wooden weapons on the wall. There was apparently space for many Yiga in this area, but nothing like the numbers described by the Gerudo. The other halls must have led to other living areas. How large was this place? And how long had they been located here? The Yiga attacked Zelda in the Gerudo Desert. This hideout must have even existed then. It was a disturbing thought. How had the Gerudo let them remain here for so long? Did they really not know until recently? Another thought concerned him. If this hideout was as large as he feared it might be, then how was he to locate the Thunderhelm? Ahead, a door opened and a Yiga stepped out, closing the door behind him. He glanced up at Link and nodded before walking past him down the hall. Link hesitated, glancing back over his shoulder, and then at the door. It was one of the few doorways with an actual door. It even appeared that it was able to be locked. Link reached out, testing the door, and found it to still be unlocked. Glancing back over his shoulder once more to ensure no one was looking, he pushed the door open slightly and peered in. It appeared to be just an individual bedroom of sorts. He saw a bed along the far wall, and red-colored paper lanterns hung from the sides. There was a chair and a small table as well, covered in papers. He let the door close and continued down the hall. Eventually, it reached a T-intersection and Link turned left. 
he passed by what looked like a large dining hall, with rows of wooden tables and benches. No one was there at the moment, however. The next room predictably held a kitchen. There were members of the Yiga in here, who appeared to be preparing for morning breakfast. He saw one counter devoted to a small pile of bunches of bananas. They really like their bananas, he thought before moving on. The early hour likely helped him move more quickly than he would have been able to otherwise. While there were still some people awake, most were still sleeping. That wouldn't last more than another couple of hours, however, he suspected. It would be morning soon. He hoped to be out of there by then. He reached another intersection and turned left, but stopped short as he came face to face with two members of the Yega clan. They each paused for a moment before Link tried to move past them, but one of them thrust a hand out, stopping him. Why are you still wearing your disguise? she said. Link tensed, preparing for a fight, but then he realized what she meant. All of the Yiga that he had seen in the base were all wearing their simple body suits. He was still wearing his clothing and the cloak. Oh, I forgot to take it off, he said lamely. She grunted in irritation. What, did you just come back from a mission? Link hesitated, but then nodded. Did it at least go well? He nodded again. Good, at least you can do something right. Go check on the prisoner, and then get out of those clothes. The master is holding a meeting this morning by the pit. He wants everyone there. Prisoner, Link thought. Perhaps one of Leona's scouts. Right, I'll be there, he said, and then attempted to move past the Yiga woman. What are you doing? I said to check on the prisoner. Oh, sorry, he said, turning around and heading back in the opposite direction. He walked past the intersection and was pleased that she didn't call out to him again. This, at least, appeared to be the right direction. He continued down this hall, which had lanterns spread out more widely than the other halls, until he reached a wooden door. He glanced back over his shoulder, satisfied to see the two Yiga members had moved on down the hall he'd originally come down. He carefully opened the door, which revealed a dark room with a table in the middle of it. Straw covered much of the floor, and the straw at the room's center appeared to have been stained by some dark fluid. The walls held various tools, narrow hammers, long knives, hooks, rope, chains. He closed the door, feeling sickened, and moved down the hall to the next door, which had a barred window. Through the opening, he could see a series of cages within the room's dark interior. He pushed this door open and stepped into the room, his mask piercing the darkness enough that he would be able to make out a huddled form in one of the small cages. It was a Garuda woman, her red hair spilling loosely down her back. She wore no more Garuda clothing, though it was covered in filth. The floor of her cage was covered in straw, like an animal's cage. In fact, the cages themselves looked more like animal cages than actual prison cells. He doubted she would even be able to stand up straight in her cage's narrow confines. When he entered the room, her head whipped around to give him a hateful glare. He could see bruising on her face and cuts along other parts of her body. She said something that he assumed was a vile curse in Gerudo, though it was nonsense to him. He reached up, lifting his mask and pulling his head back. Are you one of Liana's scouts? The woman's face registered shock, and then confusion. What? Where did you hear that name? That was confirmation enough. He approached the cage, finding the lock, a heavy iron padlock. He looked around the room for a key, but saw nothing hanging on the wall. Of course, he thought wryly. They only keep keys near the cells and stories. Who are you, Vo? What are you doing here? Are you one of the Yiga? No. I'm here to get the Thunderhelm back for your people. My people would have never sent a... Doesn't matter, he snapped. I'm not a Yiga, and I'm here to help. Do you know where they keep the keys? Do not be foolish. You will be killed if you try to infiltrate this place. You should leave now. I am more than capable of taking care of myself. Link sighed and reached into his pack, removing a narrow rod from within. The hilt of a new ancient sword, courtesy of Robbie. 
With the Master Sword, Link wasn't sure if he would need it any longer, but he figured that it would never hurt to be prepared. Now he was grateful for that foresight. He ignited the blade which bathed the room in bright blue light. The Gerudo shied away from the light, wincing and raising a hand to shield her eyes. Even Link had to admit that it was far brighter than was comfortable, considering the darkness of the room. The light would probably be very visible out in the hall, thanks to the barred window. He moved quickly, holding the padlock in one hand and carefully touching the shackle with the blade. It resisted cutting, but Link pressed harder, grunting with the effort. The metal where the blade touched began to glow red hot, and suddenly his blade slid down and through the iron, cutting the shackle off the padlock entirely. He disabled the sword and shoved it back into his pack before eventually removing the shackle from the cage door and opening it. The door squealed loudly. He froze, listening. He heard footsteps out in the hall. Cursing silently, he removed the sickles from his belts and hurried to the door, ducking down in the corner just underneath the barred window. A moment later, the door opened and three Yiga hurried into the room, weapons drawn, prepared to fight the escaped prisoner. None of them looked back to see Link until it was too late. When the Yiga were dead, he looked at the woman in the cage who slowly stepped out, stretching her back while wincing. He heard her vertebrae cracking, and she did so. She bent down and picked up one of the Yiga's sickles, looking at it with disgust. She finally looked up at Link. Tell me truthfully, were you sent by Liana? No, Link said, wiping his sickle off of one of the bodies. I was sent by Riju, but there's no time for that now. Do you know where the Thunderhelm is? Of course not. We never made it that far into the hideout before we were captured, but I assume it is with their master, this Koga, that they speak of. We? Are there more of you? Her expression darkened. Not any longer. Link thought of the previous room and grimaced. Do you think you'll be able to slip out unnoticed? Of course, she said haughtily. No, she won't, Link thought. Not with that room full of Yiga standing in her way. He hesitated, but then reached into his pack, removing the Sheikah slate. He found the icon for the shrine outside of Gerudo Town and pressed it. A blue circle appeared on the ground. He handed the slate to the Gerudo. Press that icon again and it will take you back to Gerudo Town, he said. Do me a favor, though, and... Tell Liana that I'll probably need some backup. A distraction. The Garuda woman looked at him uncertainly. This... This is your method of escape. Link said nothing. She glared at him and moved to hand it back. No. I will not use this. This... Whatever this is. I can get out to myself. Are you going to fight your way out? Link asked, voice growing clipped. He didn't have time to argue with her. I have a disguise... No one knows I'm here. In fact, he paused, thinking, and then he quickly removed his cloak. He carefully clipped it onto one of the dead Yiga's neck. He would have become noticeable to the Yiga he passed due to his clothing. Clearly, they did not walk around in their disguises around their base. With this, however, they might assume the member of the Yiga had just returned and had been killed in the dungeon. It likely wouldn't pass close scrutiny, the ones he had passed in the hall, at least, would have seen his clothing underneath the cloak. But it may buy him more time. What are you doing? Magurudo asked, frowning at him. I'm disguising myself even further. Link quickly removed his outer clothing, stripping down to the bodysuit underneath. He glanced around the room, and then wedged the clothing between one of the cages and the wall, squishing them under his boot. They wouldn't be noticed by a cursory glance of the room he hoped. There was silence for a time while Link worked. Finally, the Gerudo said, What is your name, though? Link. Yours? Barta. Great. Nice to meet you, Barta. I'm gonna go find the Thunderhelm now. He crossed towards the door, lowering the mask over his face again. Immediately, the room seemed brighter. Press the icon and tell Liana that I might need a distraction to get out. Maybe an attack. Don't actually try to engage. Just make them think you're going to attack. I'm not going to... Link whirled to look at her. 
They're going to start waking soon. I only know of one exit out of here, and there's several dozen Yiga between us and it. You can't fight your way out, and you definitely can't sneak out. He smirked, despite the gravity of the situation. After all, you're too damn tall. Barta pursed her lips, giving him a dark look. She did not argue, though. Good. Please pass my message on to Liana. I have a feeling taking the Thunderhelm is going to be like kicking a hornet's nest. He slipped out the door, but paused just outside, glancing down each hall. A moment later, there was a flash of blue from within the dungeon. He turned and looked into the dark room. Barta was gone. Well, there goes my escape plan, Link thought, smiling wryly. I think Zelda might call this one a reckless move. There was a memory there, but he couldn't devote effort to try to recall it right now. He began back down the hall, continuing down the way he had tried to go earlier, before being stopped.